All right, welcome to time period three. This is the beginning of the post-classical period. Um, this time period starts in the year 600, in which most classical empires are gone. Buddhism, since the end of the classical period, has spread throughout Central Asia and Japan, as well as Southeast Asia. Christianity um, has spread from the Mediterranean all the way north to Scotland and all the way to Southwest Asia to Persia. The major religion of this time period, Islam, has not um, developed yet. And so we'll talk more about that um, as we move further into the time period. But just keep that in mind that we won't see the development of Islam quite yet. Um, Whereas during the period, we will see the beginning of the Islamic Caliphates, the Mongol Empire. We'll talk about the development of medieval Europe, as well as early African civilizations, including the Swahili city-states, the Gold Salt Empires of Western Africa, the Delhi Sultanate of India, medieval Japan. We'll talk about the Byzantine Empire, as well as the Aztec and the Inca Empire. And by the time we get to this end of this time period, we'll have talked about how all of the trade routes that initially began during the classical period, the Silk Roads, the Indian Ocean sea lanes, the Mediterranean sea lanes, um, and the Trans-Saharan trade routes all intensify because there is such a major demand for various trade goods. We'll see um, the Islamic faith spread all the way throughout Afro-Eurasia. The Mongol Empire will have come and gone. The Americas remain isolated from Afro-Eurasia for the most part, with a couple of exceptions when we talk about the Vikings. Um, and we'll talk about how interactions between all of the major regions, whether it's Africa, Europe, and Asia, in Afro-Eurasia, in the, in the Old World, as it's called, or talking about the interactions between North, Central, and South America by 1450. So moving ahead, we are going to first begin talking about the article that I had you read, Southernization by Linda Schaefer. Now, the point of me having you read this article was that Schaefer makes a really elegant argument for the contributions of specifically Asian peoples for the development ideas, agriculture, and material life that is essential to what would eventually become known as Westernization. And basically, all of the examples that I've listed here on the right, um, cotton, gold, monsoon winds, cinnamon and pepper production, all of these things were developed in Southeast Asia, spread through South Asia, which we that's what we call India, into the Middle East and eventually to Europe. And all of these innovations basically create the foundation for Westernization. And that without these innovations, Western Europe would have never had any kind of, I would say, opportunity or a technological advancement to the point where we could see the development of industrialization, capitalism, or international trade. So basically the idea is that the tools of the modern world are developed in Asia. They spread through the Middle East and Africa, and eventually up through to Europe, where they are disseminated by Europeans. However, Europeans don't really talk a lot about how these things developed outside of Europe. And we'll have a conversation throughout this unit to talk about why that's true. So that's really just the basic idea of what I wanted you to take away from the Southernization article. Please make sure that you read it. I especially like about this article that Schaefer is really good about whenever she makes a broad generalization that she includes a very specific set of um, examples to guide the reader through to explain why she believes that she is correct and how she came up with those generalizations based on her evidence. And I think it's a really good example of what excellent academic writing looks like. It doesn't necessarily have to use a lot of big words or be overly complicated. Instead, it's about having an idea and having, you know, the sort of wherewithal to ensure that your ideas are like more than adequately supported by the evidence. So we're now going to go ahead and transition to talking about mapping southernization. So during our last time period, I gave you a map that looked remarkably like this one, and you guys um, mapped out the Silk Roads, the 
Indian Ocean sea lanes, the Trans-Saharan trade routes, and the Mediterranean sea lanes. Now what you guys are going to go th through and do is you are going to map um, those trade routes once again, but you're also going to add in the post-classical empires, so new empires, trade cities. You're going to use Schaefer's article to add in five um, different trade goods or ideas and the direction of their flow. So usually it's going to be going from east to west. You'll also be mapping the innovations that ex, um, that assisted in the expansion of the trade near sort of their point of origin. And then you'll also map out three methods of transportation. So I'll take you through all of this, don't worry. So these are the existing trade routes that we talked about during last time. Now again, this is really important. You should be working with a clean Blake map, right? So. These were the trade routes that I had you guys do last time. Don't put the trade routes in yet. Instead, you guys are going to be adding a bunch of different things before you get started, okay? So the first thing that I would like for you guys to do is to map um, new trade cities. So starting from the right-hand side, we're gonna go down to here, where my mouse is, where it is Malacca. Now you'll notice that Malacca is marked with a green dot with an orange border. I simply did that just because it otherwise seemed to get kind of trapped in between the outlines. So Malacca isn't any more special or important than the other trade cities that we're talking about. I just put this dot there to make it stand out. You're then gonna go up to um, Hangzhou and you'll put a dot for Hangzhou. You'll have Chang'an, which I made you guys map last time during the classical period, but Chang'an is still important. You guys are going to include Delhi and Calcutta. Then you'll come to the east coast of Africa and you will map Mogadishu, Mombasa, Zanzibar, and Kilwa. And these are the East African city-states that we'll be talking about in your reading. Once you've finished up with those four East African cities, you're going to add Mecca, which is going to be obviously important when talking about the Middle East and the development and spread of Islam. You'll add Baghdad, Constantinople, Novogorod, Venice, and Timbuktu. So these are all of the new trade cities. And if you guys remember from these old trade routes, you'll see that all of these new cities that developed during this time period are all around these trade routes that people began using during the classical period. And the trade is going to just increase more and more each year throughout this unit. The first empire I'm going to have you map is the Byzantine Empire. This is the Byzantine Empire at its largest extent under um, the reign of Emperor Justinian. So this is the Byzantine Empire, so you'll add that. And you'll be adding on um, a lot of other empires. So one thing you'll notice is that they're going to kind of layer on top of each other. So it is really important that you like color lightly or maybe add some kind of pattern. Otherwise your map is going to get kind of messy. I ended up just doing like a separate map for each empire. Um, then you have the Umayyad Empire, and the Umayyad Empire is one of the first empires um, that developed after the death of Muhammad. And you'll see here it is quite expansive. Ooh, I need to clean up some of the places where I went too far and erased, but that's okay. But these are the Umayyad. After the Umayyad, we will have the Abbasid Empire, another one of the Caliphates, which we will be talking about. After the Abbasid Empire, we have the very vast Mongol Empire. And again, you'll see what I'm saying here that the Abbasids, the Umayyads, the Byzantines, the Mongols, they all overlap each other. And you'll notice that these empires are all sort of within um, one particular spot for, um, for the trade routes, that they all kind of overlap each other. So we're now going to talk about the diffusion of crops, uh, pathogens, and other diseases along these trade routes. So here, um, if you're looking in the gray, you'll notice that um, cotton comes once again from Southeast Asia. It spreads from Southeast Asia to India to Eastern Africa, eventually up to the Middle East 
through the Mediterranean, the southernmost areas where it's the most tropical, um, and eventually to um, the northernmost coastal parts of Africa. And this is a very similar trade route again for sugar, which is another cash crop. The kind of odd man out here is going to be the diffusion of bananas. Um, and bananas are going to be very important when we talk about the Bantu. And you'll notice that the Bantu, or not the Bantu, the banana is going to be an exception in that it flows west because we'll be talking about how bananas were spread through the Polynesian migrations um, as well. So these are three of the possible crops that you could map. You could also um, map the diffusion and spread of spices like cloves and cinnamon. Totally valid if you want to map those. And then the diffusion and spread of the Black Death. So you'll notice that it originates in East Asia. It spreads along the trade routes through the Black Sea, Baghdad, and eventually through to Europe and North Africa. So these are all of the things that I would like for you to work on mapping. You'll notice that there are some things that you'll need to add. So for example, um, I didn't include a map of one of the post-classical Chinese dynasties. You can easily look up a map of, you know, the Sui, the Tang, or the Song empires. You have three different ones that you can choose from. Um, and that's it. So just be sure that if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, and we'll have these maps due next week. Anyway, thank you very much.